people. I don't want some people start getting up and walking out of church. So it's a dream of part one. And part two will come in the next time. Sounds like a plan? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Oh, Father, we give you thanks for your blessing. We give you thanks for this wonderful day. And on this Sabbath day, as we come into your presence to give you praise and honor and glory, Lord, we recognize that we fall short because of sin. But Lord, I pray that even in our sinful state, that you'll forgive us and that our worship will be acceptable in your sight even now. In Jesus' precious name, amen, amen. The Dreamer, part one. Our meditation comes to us from Genesis 37, verse 3 to 5, which was read so ably by Sister Denia earlier. Um, my question to everyone today, what are you dreaming about? What are you dreaming about? <clears throat> I always get some dream now and then. Sometimes I wake up and I have no dream. I'm like, what, what happened? It seemed like the night just flew by. I don't know what happened. Right? No dream, nothing. Right? Um, growing up, I must tell you, I was a little scared of dreams. Because I used to be very active. I loved to go out and play soccer, right? Uh, back in the islands, called it football. But here we call it soccer. And sometimes when I get ready to go up, I take up my cleats, right? I strap up and everything. I ready to go out, ready to play. And my mom would come out and say, I had a dream last night. I dream you'll break your foot. I tell her the game was over. Because I had a choice. If I go out and I get injured, she's going to say, you see, I dream about it. Right? But I'm conflicted because I want to go play. So I was scared of dreams. And I prayed that one day, she said, man, I dream that someone is, is dead. I'm like, oh, my word. The day is over. But as we grow up, we realize everyone has dreams. Right? What is it that we dream about? For some of us, we dream about our careers. Right? What will work hard to achieve in life. Right? Nothing wrong with a good career. Right? Nothing's wrong with that, right? We dream about relationships, right? For some of us, we, we struggle to have the relationship that we desire. We dream of having that perfect relationship with that um, estranged family. It could be our parents or siblings, right? Uh, a husband or a wife. We dream about uh, families. For some of us, uh, I remember when I was dreaming about having my own family. Man, that was some dream. I could tell you. But God had a plan. God had a better plan. Right? We dream about so many things. But some of us, we dream about that, that, that house on the hill with the picket fences. Enough, enough space to plant a garden, huh? We all have a dream. It's not wrong with dreaming. But some of us, it's just to have a car. To get from point A to point B. But some of us, it's just a dream of waking up the next morning. For some of us, it's just a dream of saying, I don't want this pain to continue. This pain in my knee, Jesus, please. When I wake up in the morning, I want it not to be there. Sometimes it's still there. We all have dreams. And today, we're going to talk about a famous dreamer in the Bible. Turn the Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 37 and verse 3. Genesis chapter 37 and verse 3. And we're going to see what lessons we can learn from this dreamer. And how it could affect our dreams. And how we react to our dreams. And when our dreams come, I don't. Genesis chapter 37 and we'll start from verse 3. Genesis chapter 37 and verse 3. I tell you, sometimes we read these Bible stories and we say, I've heard this so many times. But it it never failed. No many, how many times I open these stories, I still learn something new. And it still feels new every morning. So let's talk about Joseph. Genesis 37 verse 3 says, Now Israel, Joseph's father, loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. See some, some stuff happening here, right? So let, let's take it back real quick. So Jacob, before he was Joseph, right? Jacob, he wasn't always an upright man of God, right? He had some stuff going on in his life, right? We remember 
first and foremost, he was not the eldest child. Who was the eldest child? Esau. So by tradition, Esau should have gotten the, the birthright. And he tricked Esau. Esau was hungry one day and he stole the birthright, right? But he it, 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 it wouldn't have gotten everything without tricking his, his father as well. So he tricked his father, right? And then he was running from his brother. His brother wanted to kill him for a long time. He ran away to his uncle, was Laban. And Laban and him was back and forth with tricksters. And eventually they tricked each other and he got a bunch of animals and he left. And then he was scared that his brother's going to kill him. He started crying. And thank, thank the Lord, Jesus saved him, right? Remember when he was wrestling with Jesus at night? And Jesus blessed him. His brother took him back and, you know, he went back to his father and eventually his father passed away. So he went through a whole bunch of stuff. But because of that, even though the Lord has forgiven him for a lot of things that he did, you know who was watching him all this time? His children. His children picked up on a lot of his bad behaviors. And even though he asked for forgiveness and he gotten over it, his children were still struggling. That's a lesson there just for us too. You know, sometimes we think, you know, we, yes, we have gotten past certain things in our lives. We have to remember, there's others who are always watching. And we might find the strength and we might find the time to spend time with the Lord and to work on our weaknesses. But sometimes our children are suffering from what they see us do. And that's why we have to ensure that our example is one of Christ. So Jacob's children, they came out to be a little rude. And they would do all kind of stuff. But Joseph was a little different. Joseph always followed what his father told him. And because of this, when he go out with his brothers, and his brothers would do a little naughty stuff, he would go back and say, Daddy, I saw them doing things they shouldn't be doing. The snitching. <laughs> and they would come back, and, and the father would call them into a big family huddle and say, Hey, 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 Joseph said you guys were doing this. And they would look at him sideways. Joseph. You always think you're better than us, huh? Don't watch me in here. Right? They're always looking at Joseph sideways. So the father, obviously, because Joseph was listening to him and, you know, following what he was saying, he, he developed this extra love for Joseph. And Joseph was a child of his old age. And because of that, he, he built a special code for Joseph. We have to understand that back in those days, normally a coat had one color. And most times it's the color of the animal that was killed, <laughs> right? Or just that one die. But the fact that he has many colors means it, it was worked on a long time. It was expensive, Sister Lisa. So the father built an expensive coat for the almost the youngest son. So they're like, wait, wait, wait. We know the history that he took the birthright from his older brother. He loved this one more than us. Will he take the birthright and give it to him? So there's a lot of stuff happening here, right? Verse 4 says, And when his brethren saw that their father loved them more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. So firstly, they hate him now because his father was showing favoritism. Parents don't show favoritism. It's not cool. All right? Even if you love one child more than the other, keep it to yourself. <laughs> it's true. Keep it to yourself. Right? Don't show favoritism. We know you might love one trait more than the other. That's okay. But don't show it to the children. They don't know how to, to handle those, those emotions. All right? So they were a bit upset. Verse 5, and Joseph dreamed a dream. He's dreaming now. And he told his brethren, and they hated him even more. They hate Joseph just because he dreamed. And then Joseph did what? Verse 6. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. So now he's going to tell them the dream. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made a beast... A, Obedience to my sheaves. So in other words, um, their sheaves were bowing down to his. So the brother was like, wait, wait, wait. Shall thou indeed reign over us? 
or shall thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for the words. So now they're hating him, one that he dreamed, and they hate him some more that he dreamed so that he's going to be higher than them. There's a lot of stuff going on here. This guy has been, <laughs> it's been a tough spot. You see, my friends, there's nothing wrong with dreaming. Is that all right? Are we comfortable with that? There's nothing wrong with dreaming. But guess what? Your dreams are for you. Don't let someone else's discouragement of your dream put you down. Your dreams are for you. You see, people are not obligated to understand your dreams. Sometimes you try to explain it to someone. I say, why are you not getting it? Why you don't see that I want to start this company to help so that I could lift my family out of poverty? You can't see it. No one is obligated to understand your dream, my friends. People may try to persuade you and to give, to give up on your dreams because they don't understand it. You see, no one is required to love your dream. No one's required to love your dream. So don't be upset if others don't love and support your dream the way you do because they're not required to. Because it's not their dream. It's your dream. Make sense? He says, some will hate the fact that you even dream. Remember the brothers were upset that he dreamt? They will hate the fact that you even dream. Why? Because some people don't dream. Some people nights just fly by and nothing happens. My friends, covetousness is a thing. We know this, right? Covetousness, envy, it's a thing. That's why, the, that's why in, in, in the Bible, there's a commandment against it. It's a thou shalt not covet your neighbor or your neighbor's wife or anything of your neighbor's. Covetousness is a thing. People will hate you just because you dream. Dreams come true, my friends. Dreams come true. And as we will see in this story, that we may not understand when and where, but most times they do. And most times when they do, they surprise us. Verse 9 says, and he dreamed yet another dream. This man don't want to stop dreaming. He realized he's getting in trouble with dreams now. And he dreamed another dream and told it to his brethren and said, behold, I have a dream. I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars made obe obedience to me. And he told it to his father and his brethren, and his father rebuked him. He said, what, what are you saying? And he said unto him, what is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come and bow down ourselves to the earth to you? My friends. Sometimes not even the closest person to you will understand your dream. Sometimes you try to explain yourself even to your parents and they won't get it. You try to explain yourself to your children and they won't get it. Not even the closest person to you will understand your dreams. Not even the closest person to you. You see, because of all his dreaming, they didn't like him. And one day... All his brothers, Joseph's brothers, they went away. They take the, the, the flocks. A, they had a lot of animals, right? And they take them to different places to pasture. And they were away for a long time. So the father gets worried and, 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 and Israel says, Joseph, go look for your brothers. And based on the location, they were approximately uh, around 50 miles away. And Joseph said, no problem. And he knew his brothers hated him. But you know what? Joseph still loved his brothers. And when he traveled around 50 miles and he, he reached that, that location, he realized they weren't there. And he inquired, and they were in another location around 15 miles extra. And he went along that way, excited because he knew he needed to see his brothers. And he needed to bring a good report for his father. But see what's happened here. I picked this up in the book, Pigeons and Prophets, and he says... His brothers saw him approach him, but no thought of the long journey he had made to meet, to meet them. 
of his weariness and hunger, of his claims upon their hospitality and brotherly love, soften the bitterness of their hatred. The sight of the court, the token of their father's love, filled them with frenzy. They said, Behold, this dreamer cometh. They cried in, in mockery. Envy and revenge, long secretly cherished, now control them. You see, sometimes when you hear this story, their brother didn't just want to kill him. They had hold on to their hatred of Joseph for a long period of time. My friends, cherish envy and revenge will not help us. The first time someone do us something wrong, it might not be too bad. You might say, you know what? I can't bother, leave it alone. But you leave it alone so long, it piles up on you. And after a while, you start hating on someone, and sometimes you forget the first thing they did to you wrong. Because it was 20 years ago. My friends, we should not be holding on to any grudges. Let's not hold on to anything that someone has done to us. If it's so bad, let's talk to them. Let's call them. If we think it's too much that we could talk to them face to face, my brother, let's call someone to help us. Say, Pastor, I don't want to say something. I just want to sit in the side of the corner. Just in case if I want to slap this person, I would say, no, Pastor's there. <laughs> Right? Sometimes we have to set our differences aside. Sometimes, as families, we hold on to things that was done to us from we were children. And we grew up to be adults, no longer brothers and sisters, because we hate each other. But we are adults, we have children, we have grandchildren, and we still don't talk. We tell our kids not to talk to their cousins because we don't like them. What kind of craziness are we doing? We can't hold on to these things. And this is what these brothers were doing. They held on to it so much so that they come out with this phrase, let us slay him. They said, let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say, some evil beast had devoured him and we shall see what will come of his dreams. Their solution was to kill their brother because of his dreams. My friends, some people wouldn't mind if you don't exist because of your dreams. We need to understand these things. We're living in the last days. You see, there's no requirement for other people to love us. We know this, right? There's nowhere in the Bible that says someone will love you. You will go to heaven because someone will love you. That's not how it works. The requirement is for us to love someone. And the beauty about it is if we all are loving on someone else, we eventually will, will get what? We get loved. That's how it works. But we can't depend on other people to love us. The only person that we're 100% sure that loves us is Jesus. And all the other requirements for us to love someone else. So they want to kill their brother. And one of the elder brothers says, his name was Reuben, let's not kill him, let's throw him in a pit. Right? Let's throw him in a pit. So Joseph was punished for his dreams. First, they remove his coat. He's lost his possession. Sometimes we lose possessions because of our dreams. But don't worry about it, my friends. You see, he was isolated in a pit. Isolation de denotes loneliness. Loneliness can happen all the time to us. We'll have the best of friends, and when we tell them, listen, I want to do something great with my life today. I can't be hanging out smoking weed 24-7 with you and not working. At least let us smoke and work. No, I'm not promoting smoke. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm saying. You get the message, right? I'm not promoting that. I'm just saying. At least let us work. Sometimes when you change what you're doing and you want to do something greater, you will lose friends. That's all right. Sometimes you'll even lose family members. That's all right. As long as you still have Jesus. Loneliness is a part of the plan. Also, Joseph was extremely confused. He was in that pit wondering why his brothers 
threw him in that hole. And he couldn't see a way out. He was stressed. Sometimes, because of our dreams, we will be stressed. We will be wondering, why is it that I'm trying to help you and you are upset? I don't get it. I'm trying to help you and you are upset. I'm trying to work with you to build yourself to be a better person, a better father, a better husband, a better wife, a better child, a better friend, and you are upset. You see, my friends, sin only leads to sin. Because first, the brothers did what? They hated Joseph. And because they hated him, they wanted to do what? To kill him. They want to bring violence. You see how the sin is just growing? And because they hated him and they want to kill him, even when they decide not to kill him, they, they had no regard for him. They were comfortable to throw him in a hole. And when they throw him in a hole, now they realize, hey, we have to do even more. Because eventually, their conscience was bothering them. They said, man, we can't kill our own brother. It's our flesh and blood. And they see a, 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 a train passing, right? People are going by who are selling slaves. I say, you know what? Let's sell them to that, those people. If you go into Egypt, we'll never see him again. And they sell him into Egypt. But now they have to tell it their father something. But they remember they have the coat. So now they have to lie and they kill a goat and they spread the, the blood on the coat and they go home to their father and they say, Daddy, I think he's dead. Is this your son's coat? And Joseph uh, and Jacob checked it and he realized that, yep, that's my son's coat. And the poor father was there bawling down the place, crying. He cried for years for his son and none of the others say, you know, I don't think he's really dead, you know. They did not care. Because sin keeps growing. My friends, we have to stop the cycle at some point. You see, a, a cycle of sin will only stop with Jesus. If you're here this morning in Sabbath school, you would you'd, you'd recognize from the lesson that we're inherently selfish and evil. If we don't seek outside help, we will continue sinning constantly. Because we're all born in sin and shaping in iniquity. Sin is natural to us. We're not, we're not naturally good. You, you know this, right? We're not naturally nice people. We're not naturally good people. We're not naturally kind and loving. A little baby could be just born, and, and if, 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 you, if, you, if the baby takes something that he shouldn't take, and you look at the baby, they hide it. And you wonder, who teach this child to be stealing and hiding? And you sure you didn't teach this child. Sure you did not do it. It's inherent. It's a part of our nature. We need something outside of us to stop the cycle. Because sin will just keep rolling along like what happened to these individuals. So even in our lives, we have to get Jesus in. Right? Don't think that we're big enough or man enough or we go to church enough or we pay enough tithe so we can stop sinning on our own. It doesn't work. We need Jesus. Spirit of Prophecy says, Meanwhile, Joseph with his captors was on the way to Egypt. As the caravan journeyed southward towards the borders of Canaan, the boy could discern in the distance the hills among which lay his father's tents. Bitterly he wept at thought of that loving father in his loneliness of affliction. He was crying because what he knew his father was going to go through. Again, the scene at Dotham came up before him. He saw his angry brothers and felt their fierce glances bent upon him. The stinging, insulting words that had met his agonized entreaties were ringing in his ears. With a trembling heart, he looked forward to the future. What a change in situation. From the tenderly cherished son to the despised and helpless slave. You see, Joseph moved from the special child, the one who get most of the love. I just imagine sometimes jo Jacob would just take a bigger part of the, the, the dinner and put aside just for Joseph. Huh? He would get special treatment. So he moved from special treatment to slave treatment. 
Sometimes, because of our dreams, we'll move from here to here. And we won't fully understand what's happening in our lives. You see, it says here, alone and friendless, what would be his lot in a strange land to which he was going? For a time, Joseph gave himself up to uncontrolled grief and terror. You see, when it seems our dreams will not be realized for a time, it, it could get us down. Because we're human, right? But we have to remember where our dreams came from in the first place. You see, what Joseph went through, as much as it was hard in the moment, it was needed. It was a blessing for him. Because we have, to, we have to realize, if you are treating one child special right through their lives, letting them think that they're exalted among the other children, what do you think will happen to them mentally? They will start believing it. They start thinking they're better than the other, the other children. They start looking down on their sibling. They, they start, you know, lording themselves over their, their other sibling. Joseph needed a correction as well. So as much this was tough for him, this also was a correction in his character. You see, Joseph, because of all his teaching, his mind went back to this. He says, then his thoughts turned to his father's gods. In his childhood, he had been taught to love and fear. Often in his father's tents, he had listened to the story of the vision that Jacob saw as he fled from his home an exile and fugitive. He had been told of the Lord's promises to Jacob and how they had been fulfilled. Oh, in the hour of need, the angel of God had come and instruct and comfort and protect him. And he had learned of the love of God in providing for men a redeemer. Now all these precious lessons came vividly before him. Joseph believed that the God of his father would be his God. He then and there gave himself fully to the Lord and he prayed that the keeper of Israel would be with him in the land of exile. Joseph moved from crying to recognizing I'm still a child of God. My friends, my question is, in the time of trouble, Joseph thought went back to God. Are we confident that we are training our children enough so that when they are going through their trials, their mind will go back to God. When our children have set their dreams up and we send them off to college and they fail the first class, what will they do? Will they get drunk with their friends? Will they start taking drugs because they can't manage? Or will their thought go back to God? We have to set our children up like what um, Jacob did to Joseph so that even in his hardest trial, he could go back to God and say, you know what? This might not be working out the way I planned, but God is still my God, right? He's still in control. You see, in Joel 2 verse 28, it says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Upon how many? All flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. In these last days, my friends, we will all be dreamers. We'll all be having visions. We all have a role to play in what's coming, right? When we look at the world today, if, if we and if all of us as individuals don't have a dream for your life, we're losing. We're on a losing battle. Because everyone has a path they want to follow. Everyone has a vision. Everyone has a goal. Everyone has an idea of where they want to go. So we have to be sure what is our dream. And what is the focus of our dreams. You see here, Joseph was brought into Egypt. And he was sold to the captain of the king's guard. To a man called Potiphar. And uh, Joseph worked real well because he was doing only what he knew to do. And he kept focus on his dream. 
My friends, we have to keep focus on our dreams. Joseph spent 10 years in Potiphar's house. How many years? 10 years. And in that 10 years, he couldn't see his dream as yet. But Joseph knew that dreams take time. Sometimes we're going through some real hard times, my friends. Things don't work out how we had planned it. We had, we, we, some of us, we move from other countries, we come here. Some of us, we, 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 we're born here, we grew up. A lot of things didn't work out what we wanted to. But don't give up. Not everything will work out in the same time for everyone. Everything takes time, and God has a reason for everything. You see, Joseph was in the midst of idolatry. And in the midst of idolatry, he was still holding on to God. The Bible says he preserved his simplicity and fidelity to God. You see, we have to understand we are in the world, but we don't have to be of the world. Right? Like Joseph, he was living, idolatry was surrounding him. We can't take ourselves out of this world. And we know that the majority of the people here don't even believe that God exists. Is that a reason to stop believing in God? Is that a reason to stop loving God? Is that a reason to stop loving our brothers and our sisters? Not at all. It says the sights and sounds of vice were all about him. But he was as one who saw and heard not. His thoughts were not permitted to linger upon forbidden subjects. The desire to gain the favor of the Egyptians could not cause him to conceal his principles. Let's talk about that. It says um, his thoughts were not permitted to linger upon forbidden subjects. My friends, as we're here, going through this life, having our dreams of being where Jesus is, we can't allow our thoughts to linger on the things that are forbidden. Right? Things will come in front of us. We 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 on the job, you know. I we, we most of us work in environments. Sorry, work. Most of us work in environments where individuals they would curse and they will do all manner of things, right? But even with that, don't get distracted. Don't get distracted with what's happening because you may you also may lose your salvation. Let me just pull this back up real quick. All right. So my question is, no way it's not changing. One second. I'm sorry. One minute. Can you reset it? I think I bung this out. We're good. I don't want to go ahead and you miss. I know a lot of you take pictures of the slides. I take this out. No, it's, it's loading on the screen. Amen. Yep. This one. Thank God for technical people, right? <laughs> so my question is, what are you dreaming about? If your dream is only for the things that are temporal, it is not complete. The most important dream is to be like Christ. That's the most important dream. So if you want to be a farmer, you should be a Christ-like farmer. If you're going to be a teacher, you have to be a Christ-like teacher. If you want to be a great husband, you have to be a Christ-like husband, a Christ-like wife. Uh, even if you don't have a job or a career, you want to be a Christ-like unemployed person. 
whatever it is, you have to be Christ-like. And this is what we have to understand. And if we wrap our dreams around the things of the Lord, evil allow it to come, th- come true in the times that we need it most. You see, most times our dreams don't come true because we didn't get them from the Lord. We just make them up to f- fill a void that we think we have in our lives. You know, we think we need something so bad, so we just make up a dream. And we didn't ask the Lord, is this what you want for me? Is this the dream that you have for me and for my life? You see, Joseph didn't get a chance to decide if he wanted to go into Egypt. But God knew that he needed to be in Egypt. And as we will go into the part two, we're going to get more into that part of the, the gospel. You see, Jesus makes our dreams come true. Jesus is the one that sets us up, right? And that's why we have to seek him first. And then all other things will be added after that. You see, my dream is to be where he is. There's a lot of things I have to do here while I wait, while we wait for the coming of the Lord. There's a lot of things I have to get done, right? I have to be a good father. I have to be a wonderful husband. I have to provide for my family. I have to do a whole lot of stuff. But first and foremost, my dream is to be there. And because I know I want to be where Christ is, I will follow wherever he leads. Wherever he wants me to go, whatever he wants me to do, I will follow it humbly. I'm not trying to prove a point. Right? If the Lord says, listen, today I want you to just be quiet and say nothing, I'll quiet and say nothing. If he says today you need to be out in the streets, let's be out in the streets. If tomorrow we need to be out in Bristol promoting the church work, that's where we need to be. Because our dream should ultimately be to be where he is. Because we have to understand, God will only provide for us in this life what we need to be where he is. If God recognized that if I become a millionaire, I'm going to leave him. You know what God will not let me do? Be a millionaire. Because God said, you ain't, you ain't going to be to heaven if you're rich. Next thing you, <laughs> you, you, you all flaunting all over the place and we can't find you. You're not preaching in church anymore. No, you're going to stay right here. But if God knows that if you're poor, you're going to be cursing him day out, day, day in. And if you have money, you'll be good with it and help people. You know what God will make you do? Have some extra money. Because you could bless somebody with it. So God knows where to keep each one of us so that our ultimate dream of being where he is can be fulfilled. So when we pray and we secure that our dream is in Christ, he will fulfill the rest. He will take care of the other stuff. He will make sure that everything we need in this life to be where he is, will be provided. So my question to everyone today as I close, what are you dreaming of? What are you dreaming of? I want each one of us to ponder on, on it today. I said today I just want to give a message that all of us can relate to. From young to whole, the children, those going to college, everyone What are you dreaming of today? I implore you, make your ultimate dream to be with Christ. And everything else will fall into place. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you so much for your mercies and your grace. Lord, we thank you that you have placed in your word these inspirational stories that can help us to understand that there's nothing wrong with dreaming. There's nothing wrong in want what's best for our lives. But Father, in all that we do, help us to put you first. Because if we put the other stuff first, then we have created a new God. So Father, please guide and guard our thoughts, our lives and our dreams, so that the things we aspire to will be to be like you. So that you could bless us in ways that we, can e- we can't even ask or imagine. Father, we thank you for all that you have done for us. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. 
This is my asking in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.